First Peter chapter 3, we will finish up chapter 3. There's only two verses left, I think. So we'll finish up 3, we'll get into chapter 4 today. We don't got a lot left of First Peter. So Peter has been challenging this church and our church all this time later about submission and, and being submitted to uh, to the government, being submitted to our, our leadership or our bosses. Um, in this context here, there was still slavery and so servant to master. Um, being submissive husbands and wives submitting to one another uh, according to the way that we are instructed to do that. And in doing that, I think the, the insinuation there of, of the husband to care for his wife is more than even being submitted to her, just as a fellow believer, which comes next. But it's submission to God to care and take care of his wife. I, I believe that because it ends that one verse with that your prayers may not be hindered. So... In caring for your wife and loving for her husbands, that is, that is our submission to God, ultimately. And then finally, being compassionate, he said in verse 8, uh, or being of one mind, having compassion for one another, loving as, as brothers, uh, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called uh, to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Okay. Uh, he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, uh, his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from uh, from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to the to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Again. The implication of submission to God ultimately. The other things, as we narrow them down, as Peter kind of focused on them, may seem difficult or have their difficulties, but as we back up from those, we see that ultimately in walking in those things and being able to walk uh, in submission to one another, in putting others first, if we do that, then the Lord's ears are open to us, open to our prayers. Where if uh, we don't, then we're, we're still evildoers. If, if we're not willing to walk in love, if we don't seek peace, if we don't um, watch what we say and how we say it, uh, even to take the truth and speak it with, a, with the intent of deceiving somebody, that's, that's not okay. And... So to, to walk separately, and, and this has kind of been, I guess, at least since we started First Peter, the, the idea of the Christian life should be obviously different from those who are lost. There should be an obvious difference. People should be able to tell. Our, our ideas, our reasoning is not the same. But we see in Romans chapter 1 that those who have set their hearts and minds against God who've embraced the worship of creation rather than the creator and have gone down the road of overindulgence in every facet. And, and Paul in Romans chapter 1, their focus is on sexual immorality. But when we go and we move into overindulgence, and especially that, we separate ourselves from God. And we're not walking according to the word of God. right? And so it should be the other way. We should be... Uh, if we walk with the Lord, Peter's telling us that it should look different. We, we should be different. Paul would say the same thing. We're going to see a list today. There are many lists in the New Testament of if you do these things, you're not part of the kingdom. Or stay away from these things that you used to do. Because that was your old life. That's kind of the, the uh, positioning that Peter's going to take with the list today. We stay away from that; those things. We're, we're set free from those. We're not slaves to that. We should be able to exhibit self-control. And listen, today, 
a little bit of self-control shines very brightly in our world right now because there is a an idea out there that there should be no self-control. And we'll get to that in a minute. But the remembrances that are put in these things, in these teachings here that Peter gives us, keep pointing us back to the, the ears of the Lord are open to those who do righteousness. The eye of the Lord is on that person. He's paying attention. It may seem like if you're trying to walk according to the word of God, if you're trying to follow his precepts, if you're in the word, you're reading, you're praying, you may feel like you don't have his ear, like you don't, he, he's not watching you, he's not paying attention. Circumstances just keep getting bigger and bigger. I've prayed and I've prayed and nothing's changed. God must not see me, God must not hear me. That's not true. It may feel like that, but our feelings lie to us. Our feelings push us into the direction of self-indulgence rather than self-control. Where what we know is true reigns us in and keeps us in self-control, even if it doesn't feel like God's paying attention, because we know He is. His Word tells us He is. And so we can rest on that. We can, we can hang on to that. That feeds our hope for the day that's yet to come. When we see His face. Because He's told us He's coming. And so self-control is, is enormously important. And like I said, right now, in, in the way things are right now, a little bit of self-control. To hold your tongue, to hold your peace, to, to hold yourself back, to not move into the old life and, and just give up on trying to do right. Because right is hard. We're already at war within ourselves to do what's right and to walk in righteousness and to be holy because our God is holy. That's already hard within ourselves. But then when we add all the pressure from everybody else around us to conform to what we're doing and what we're saying, or you don't like me, then the pressure is there to conform to that and to just give up on self-control. And we don't want to do that. Because to just conform to somebody who's lost just leaves them lost. If we conform to the lost world, if the church operates the way the world does, if we do the same things the world does, if we, if we don't have self-control, if we don't have that difference in us that shines out compared to the rest of the world, then you know, we, we're not making a difference. We're looking like them. They can't tell the truth. They can't see God. And it's not that you and I are God. But they ought to be able to see Him in our life. And we, we do them an injustice to, to act and speak and, and do the things that they do. Because we're not giving them the truth. They're still living a lie that says indulge in what you want to indulge in. And everything will be good and God will just let you in anyway. And when a Christian conforms to that, then we're, we're conforming to a lie and we're letting them believe a lie. But if we'll conform to, the, to God, if we'll live like the image that we're created in, if we'll, if we'll do what he's commanded us to do, what he's called us to do, and what he's enabled us to do, if we get far enough today, we'll get into that a little bit, but and what he's enabled us to do, if we'll do those things, then we're taking the truth to a dying world. And, but we have to be able to do it in love. And listen, we've got opportunity. We should come together often so that we have opportunity to practice love on one another. That we'll be able to serve one another. Because we don't have any hope of serving the lost if we can't serve each other. We don't have any hope of representing God to the lost if the family of God can't serve one another and interact with one another. And that's going to include everything that it will include to serve your lost friends and family. Because we're going, to, we're going to bump into each other. We're going to rub on each other. We're going to have to forgive each other. We're going to have to, you know, we have to hug. We have to, we have to be together. Even when we don't want to be, we, we have to do these things. We learn by doing. Not just by me standing up here and reading the list. You, you have to be with one another. You have to interact with one another. And I am one who does not believe that 
social media gives you proper interaction with anybody. It's most of the time just words on a screen. And we, we've narrowed our life experiences all the way down to little bitty screens that we can stick in our pocket. That's a distraction. That is by design. By design of, of, of the evil one. He has taken it. Now, I believe that you can use the internet, you can use your social media to be a minister. You can. To give words of encouragement, to share the word of God. You absolutely can do that. But take 10 of your posts, if you are on social media, go back on the last 10 of your posts, and how many of them in that 10 actually point to God and are not your opinion about an issue. And I'm, I'm not going to be any better, so I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger. This is just a challenge that I'm feeling right now, and that I'm, I believe God is, would challenge every Christian that way. How many of your posts out of 10 point to Jesus? They're a Bible verse. They're a biblical principle. There's some kind of teaching that you're sharing rather than political. And I'm not saying don't do the political things, man. You want to campaign for somebody, campaign for somebody. But you ought to be campaigning for Jesus more than you are for a political person, a politician, at any level. And so your political post can be filled with scripture. If you don't think so, then you need to, if it ever gets safe enough again, go to Washington, D.C. and go see the Lincoln Memorial. His speeches that are on the wall, full of scripture. There's Bible verses chiseled in stone all around that town. You know? So you can. You can be political and you can be politically active and still be a born-again Christian who is promoting God and promoting His ideals over just confronting everybody you think is wrong. We can do that. Because, listen, if you're promoting God at a biblical level, you're gonna, you're, automatically you're going to confront anybody who's out there who's anti-God. It, it'll be up. The challenges will come. And I'm not even saying you have to address all the challenges, but just put them out there and, and do that. Right? So remember, though. Remember, and, and in this time, it's going to be imperative for you to remember. To that, that if you are walking in righteousness, you have God's ear and you have his eyes. He's looking at you. He's hearing you. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And we've seen over and over again in the Psalms on Wednesday night, many of those who followed the, followed the Lord and and wrote psalms, things that are included in scripture, many of them are, were looking at the evil of their day and going, Lord, how much longer? How much longer are you going to let this happen? How much longer are the nations going to be allowed to rage against you? How much longer are you going to let the wicked prosper? Why does it seem like those who follow you don't, don't prosper? They don't move ahead. They don't get ahead. Why does it seem like that when it seems like all the wicked get whatever they want? It's only a matter of time. What we saw on Wednesday night, absolutely, they will not get away with it. Nobody's getting away with anything in the eyes of God. He's watching everybody. But it's that different look. Verse 13 said, and we're still going back over what we already went through. Uh, and, he, and who is he who will harm you if you, uh, if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats nor their trouble. We went into that last week, not to be afraid of the threats or in trouble. It's not, the, it's not that you'll never be afraid because the feelings will come. Right? I feel danger. We're, we're built that way. God made us that way. He gave us emotions. He gave us the feelings so that we would know when things are wrong, not just when things are right, but also when things are wrong. It's, you know, 
It's like pain in your body. If you have a pain, you know something's wrong. And, and it tells you, you know, where the doctor should look for the cause. So it's the same. I, I'm not disregarding feelings and all of that. I don't think God does. But we don't let them rule our life. You're going to become targets. If you are going to stand for what's right and not compromise the word of God, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer from family. You're going to suffer rejection from friends. You're going to suffer persecution in public. It's going to happen. But don't be troubled by them. Right? Don't be so afraid. When it says don't be afraid of, of somebody who might be able to harm you or who can harm you. In other words, who can, who can really, honestly, I mean, let's take it to the extreme. If somebody kills you, what do they do? They send you home to the Father. God has allowed it. It's done. Right? You're done. That's, that's your ticket home. But they're not going to be able to destroy you here. They're not going to destroy your faith. We talked about that last week. Your eternity started the day you gave your heart to the Lord. Your eternity with Him started then. Now eventually we'll get to a place where there's no more days, there's no more nights, so the, the time clock will stop. There's a time clock on us right now. We're, we're inside of time. That's ticking. That's winding down. We're going to talk about that today if I can get past the review. <laughs> and... and you know, it, it's it's going, but eventually when that, talk, when that clock stops ticking, we're still alive. We're still moving. We're, we're living with the Lord forever. There are places in the Bible, in Revelation, it talks about that to never be away from Him ever again. The feeling that God isn't here or the feeling that you're alone when you know you're not. You know He's here. You know He's with you. You know you have the Holy Spirit. But then you'll be able to see him. What you know to be true will be so fully realized that the writers who, who make that comment, like John, are just saying, I don't have any other way to put it other than you just won't ever be separated again. You'll never feel that again, that you're separated from God. Isn't that, isn't that good? There's a day coming when you, you know you won't feel... Separated anymore? That, that what you know will be so true, manis, manifested so fully, that, the, that you won't even have a temptation to think that you're alone anymore. Ever. So don't be afraid of their threats. Don't be troubled. And, and again, that's hard. And if you're reading a lot, you hear the threats. You, the intent is to trouble you. Those threats are not just inspired by the evil in men's hearts. Those threats are inspired by the enemy. Speaking to their hearts. Taking their evil and ratcheting it up for them even more. Giving them words to express their feelings. And they make threats. And, and they can be troubling if you, if you watch those. If you read them and you take them in. But don't let it trouble you. When you feel the troubling emotions coming, when you feel that fear coming, back up. Get back into what you know is true. Remember these verses. Don't be troubled by their threats. Go to Joshua and read the first chapter of Joshua and see how many times God told him, be strong and courageous. I'm with you. Right? So we need to, we need to stay there in the word of God. Sanctify, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready for, to give a defense to everyone who asks you for, who, excuse me, now I can't read, who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So if you're living that life that's obviously different from everyone else, you're going to get the questions. Why are you still smiling when nobody else is? How can you smile today? How, how can you still live like you have hope? 
You, you need to be ready to give the reason. Why is the reason? What is the reason for your hope? What is the reason that you can smile in a world that is so desperately going after anything anti-God? What's your hope? Just Is it Jesus? My hope is Jesus. What do you mean your hope is Jesus? Because that's the next question that's coming. This is be ready to give a defense, an apology, or a, a, and not an apology like go down, take a knee, and say I'm sorry. This is apologetics. This is reasoning. This is why I believe what I believe. How can you believe in the Bible? How can you believe in things that are thousands of years old? Well, let me tell you. I know the culture. I know the practices for keeping these things. I know how diligent and, how, and to what great lengths they went to make sure their scrolls were copied correctly. And let me explain it to you. In the New Testament, we have so many copies of full books and partial books and verses that we can lay them on top of each other and get an absolutely accurate uh, representation of the original. And to say that even if they burn this up, we could reproduce the entire thing just from the, the writings of the early church fathers except for 11 verses that don't change anything. So God went to great lengths to make sure this stayed pure and true. So then I go and I look at the prophecies, right? And I can read the prophecies and I can see the prophecies. And I can see the ones that are true. I can look through history and see the things that God has written that are true. And I can see the things that are even going on now that he spoke of them, you know, centuries ago. I can see him moving in this chaos and it's not really falling apart. It's really all coming together. His plan is coming together in spite of what the enemy is trying to make us see as, as chaos and destruction. God's plan is coming together. I can, you can, can you do that? Can you give that, that kind of argument? Because you can't just point to the Bible and say, well, this book changed my life and that's why. Because a Muslim can point to the Quran and say the same thing. You, you can't do that. That's not enough. You need to know why you know what you know or why you believe what you believe. That's going to be it's so important to people. Now, I wish I could tell you that that will just change massive amounts of, li of lives in your, in your circle of friends and family. But I also know this. There are verses that talk about when they've embraced it so much, God will give them over to their reprobate minds. That in the end, he'll give them strong delusion to believe the lie. Those who have rejected him. And so, it's like, there's hope for everybody because we're not God. We don't know who has crossed the line. So from our perspective, there's still hope for everybody. We're not absolved from our, our, our commission or our command to go and, and preach the gospel. Uh, to everyone and, and to make disciples everywhere we go. That, we're not absolved from that. But God has told us that especially in the end they're basically going to lose their ability to reason. Real reasoning. And they'll reason the way the world reasons. The, the, they'll reason according to the enemy's lies. So be ready for that. Guard your heart with that. You're going to face the disappointment. I think that's part of the suffering. You know, the suffering that Peter talks about, I don't think, is just people calling you names, just people telling you to get away from me and never speak to me again. Part of the suffering is us knowing how close they are and yet how far they are from God. Part of our suffering is carrying the weight of knowing so many people are going to die in their sin. It, 
we talk often about, about how Jesus in the Bible talks about this, how he came. He experienced every temptation that we would ever experience and overcame them. Walked a perfect life, but he, we see at the tomb of, uh, or uh, yeah, at the tomb of Lazarus, he weeps for what death has brought to his friends and their family. So he experienced everything that that we've experienced. But on this side of our salvation, we get to, I think, experience something that he also experienced, and that is the weight of those who would still reject him. That's part of our suffering right now. Carrying that through this life. So we set God aside. Not aside is like sit over here and, and wait your turn. But we, we set him apart. We sanctify him. Just like he's sanctifying us. We set God aside. or uh, Not aside, but apart in our lives. He is preeminent in all things. That's, that's the thing. We, we make him... We, we put him in that position in our heart. He is preeminent in all things. It means he's number one in everything. When, when we need to make a decision, he's our first consideration. He's the most important relationship that we have. Set, set him in that position in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you, a reason for the hope uh, that is in you with meekness and fear. So with self-control and, uh, and fear, maybe that again speaks to that suffering of carrying the weight that they're going to reject or that many will. Having a good conscience um, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if, uh, if it is the, the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Which is another repeated theme throughout the Bible and Peter. What are you accomplishing if you're suffering for doing what's wrong? You, know, you, that, that, you kind of are getting what you got coming. Kind of thing. But it's good if you suffer for doing good. Another seems weird. Not a very... <laughs> Not a, not a very uh, popular message even within the church. It's good if you're suffering for doing good. That, that's good. What? No, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring, uh, bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. All right? And so he suffered once for sins that he didn't commit for our sins. The just for the unjust. Now, if you're walking with the Lord, if you are born again Christian, now you're justified. And so now if you are, are suffering in bringing them to God, it's a picture of, of Jesus suffering the just for the unjust. Picture that. Your suffering isn't just for Jesus. It is, number one. Right? The apostles, when they were arrested and beaten and let go and said, don't preach in this name anymore, they walked out and they were full of joy because they were found worthy to suffer for Jesus. Right? So, uh, so there's that. So you, you should, you're suffering for God. But you're also suffering for them. Somebody who you're going to get to talk to over and over again who's going to oppose you. You're suffering for their sake. Or, you're, or if it's public, you're suffering for the sake of those who are hearing the, the argument between the two. And you may come away from an instance like that, whether it's just you and one other person or whether it's a public debate kind of thing. You may come away from that not feeling great and feeling like you lost, but your suffering isn't just for Jesus at that point. Your suffering is also for all the unjust, just like Jesus did, who are there. You're being the example of one who will stand for righteousness no matter what. No matter what.
And he did it so that he could bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits. And we talked about that. I'm not going to get into all that again. Um, but that's not souls, it's spirits. Right? It's pneuma. It's not, it's not the word for soul. It's the word for spirit. And we talked about in these next couple of verses, these being those fallen angels that he went and basically made the declaration I won. I told you I was going to win. You did everything you, you could to, to destroy men, to pollute men, and yet I was still able to come in the form of a man, take on the flesh of a man, become their sacrifice, become their Savior and Lord. I win. And, and, it's, and I lean this way that he did this after his resurrection. It wasn't, you know, nah, 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 I still won. It was, see, I am, truly, King of kings and Lord of lords. And you couldn't stop my plan. Whatever, you, whatever they did in the days of Noah wasn't enough to stop God's plan. And so then we get to verse 21, which is where we left off. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God angels and authority and powers having been made sub subject to him right, so the antitype or the picture we've been given a picture of, of this in that uh, in its baptism and not that we're removing the filth of flesh so being baptized doesn't make you more saved. It's not for that. You're not like going to go under, come up, and you're, you are done with all of your struggle with your flesh after that. That's not what it's saying. And that's what the parentheses is talking about. But it's an answer of a good conscience for God. It was identifying with God. One pastor put it this way. In, the, in Acts, at the beginning of the church, the birth of the church, there were no altar calls. You got saved and you got baptized. Your baptism was your public display of, I identify with Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. That's why baptisms, I believe today, even still should be public. To the greatest degree that they possibly can. I think the last one we did, we did here inside the church, but the church was full of people. And some... Some people who are lost who won't go to a church know that this is such an important thing in the life of a, of a believer that they'll show up. They'll come to baptisms. They show up on Christmas Eve to appease God. They show up on, on, on Easter to appease God. They show up on Mother's Day to appease Mom. And they show up at baptisms because for whatever reason, we don't know, but that's important to that person and I need to be there. And they think they're coming to celebrate the person. When the person is saying, this isn't about me at all. This is about my testimony. I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am new. I'm a new creature. I'm a new creation. He has made me alive again. I was dead. Now I'm alive in Jesus Christ to live with him forevermore. That's what it's all about. But they don't understand that. That's why I make sure that when we have a baptism, we have some kind of a message about salvation there. And, and the greatest thing that I could think of happening is one of, those, one of those lost people going, oh, that's what it's about? I want to get saved. Can I be baptized right now? Yes. Yes, you can. There, there are churches that, that when people come to an altar call, man, they've got... They've got extra clothes in the back room that they can go find something that fits and go get in the baptismal right now and, and get baptized on that day. And some people say, oh, you need to put them through classes. You need to make sure they're the right age. Listen, if they know enough that they needed to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they've been to class. If they know that that baptism is important enough to them, they've been to class. If it's been explained to them, it doesn't take 
weeks of Sunday school classes to explain to somebody what baptism is and why it's important. It's a couple of verses throughout the Bible. It's knowing a little bit about the culture and what baptism meant to the Jews. And that, that puts that importance in that person. I mean, I've seen people be nervous at baptisms, and I honestly, if they were honest with me, I think it's because they're afraid. They're re they, they just reached a point of no return, man. If I go under the water, the pastor puts this on me, I have to be more committed than I was ready to be now. Because there's that sense that I'm representing an eternal truth. I'm representing the eternal God. I'm identifying with him. I am saying I am one of his. And that should cause some fear in us. That in that moment and from that moment on, I'm going to represent God well. We should feel a little pressure on that. Not so much that you don't, man. Don't be afraid to, to get in there. God will help you. The Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit was with you since since. That moment you asked him to forgive you of your sins, the Holy Spirit came into your heart. You have God with you. And he is the one who will help you and enable you and pick you up when you do fall and brush you back off and get you back on the right road. He's the one. God doesn't leave you because you mess up. So don't be so afraid that you don't get baptized. It doesn't make you more saved. I mean, you could get up from an altar call having given your heart to the Lord, walk out the door and get hit by a car. You're still going to heaven. Even if you didn't get wet, you're still going to heaven. So it's having that good conscience toward God. I, you know, it, it should do something to help with that relationship, make you feel closer to God. It should. But, it says, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God? Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Again, we've been talking about submission, right? But these other forms of submission on ours is us willfully, in obedience to God, submitting to somebody else. At this point, Jesus being in the presence of God has had all the powers, all the angels, all authorities, all of them made subject to him. All of them. There's not an angel fallen or not that is not subject to Jesus. And as far as man is concerned, the Bible tells us that every knee at the end when the final part of the resurrection is taken care of, every knee will bow. Every single tongue that has ever said anything will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all to the glory of God the Father. And in that scene, in that moment, there will be those of us who have given our heart to the Lord, and it will be a willful submission. Man, we won't be able to get down fast enough and, and low enough. But even those who never gave their heart to the Lord for that one moment are going to do the same thing. Every day. Fallen angel, angel, all of creation, every being created will say, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. The question is, are you going to do it because you want to? Are you going to do it because you love him? Is it going to be your, your act your willful act of obedience, your willful act of giving glory and honor to God, or are you going to be made to do it? Are you going to be put in submission or in subjection to Him? That's the big question. One way or another, we're all going to see God. All of the lost will see Jesus. All of the saved will see Jesus. Those who are saved are going to see him at the Bema Seat Judgment. The judgment where we pass through the refining fire, where everything that we ever did for ourselves is burned up, gone away, and we come out refined like pure gold, and we receive our gifts from him, our rewards from him, for having done things for him. 
But everyone who rejects Christ, every single one will see him as the judge. And the Bible tells us the books will be open and their lives will be compared to the righteousness of God. And if they have rejected him, then it will be case closed and there'll be another book opened up. And if their name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, into the lake of fire, eternal judgment, a place created for Satan and the fallen angels. And they will enter into that too. So the choice is ours. Do we submit ourselves or do we be made subject to him? By the, do we come to him as the, the king that came with peace that said, hey, grace and mercy, man, come to me. Everybody who comes to me, I won't turn away a single one. Came on a donkey. A, a king who came in peace into a city came on a donkey. A conquering king comes on a white horse. And in the end of Revelation, we see Jesus coming on a white horse. As the conquering king. Is he going to be your savior or is he going to be your conqueror? Is he going to be your savior or are you going to be made to be subject to him? Can you look forward to the day when you see his face? Like that is going to be the greatest day ever. Better than the day I saw my bride standing at the back of the church. Better than the day my kids were born. That day when I see his face. I'm still looking forward to that day. Is that how you look forward to the day you see Jesus? Or is it with fear and dread where you think you can still run and hide from him? Or are you still so full of arrogance to think that you can dismiss him and, and take his throne? That you're the one that has the power. You're the one that has the authority. And not even God can tell you what to do. You will find out that's not true. So we get into, into chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in, in the flesh... Arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. All right, so therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. It's not a Second Amendment verse. Arm yourselves also with the same mind. The same mind as him being willing to suffer for others, right? For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. If you're going to suffer for others, you are fulfilling the second commandment that Jesus said is second. When he was asked what was, what was the greatest commandment, his response is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So if you're willing to suffer, you're, you're willing to love your neighbor as yourself. You're, you're putting others first. And so when that is your focus, you've ceased from sin. If that's not your focus, if your focus is all about you and what will make you feel good and what will uh, make you satisfied, and, and, and that's all it is, is you, then you're, you're not suffering for others. You're not walking with the Lord. You, you haven't ceased from sin it doesn't mean you're not going to ever mess up again in this life you will but what is your focus are you willing to say you know like david renew in me a right spirit create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. take cast me not away from your presence but restore to me the joy of my salvation of your salvation actually david doesn't even call it his salvation he calls it the lord's salvation Restore to me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. When you fall, is that your thought? Lord, what have I done? I'm sorry. Or is it just, well, we're going to cover this up and we're going to cover that up and hopefully God didn't see. Maybe he was, you know, looking at Pastor Glenn and, didn't, and missed me or, or whatever. It, that's not going to happen. That's not how it works. Right? So you're, you're going to 
You are going to fall. But have you ceased? Are you working towards sin? Are you working to fulfill your sin? Are you working to fulfill yourself? Or have you ceased from that? And, and now are you fighting and resisting against that? And are you chasing after God? Are you being like David, a man after God's own heart? Are you, are you being that? We, it says, verse 2, we should no longer live uh, the rest of this time, or the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Is that our main thing? Are we living for the will of God? For everybody to see what the will of God is. Can you even explain what the will of God is? Again, we're back to chapter 3. It says, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness and lust and drunkenness and revelries and drinking parties and abominable idolatries, you know, we've done enough. We spent enough of our past. Psalm 90 tells us, Lord, praise that we, Lord, teach us to number our days. Right? To know what, how much time we have left. You know, it's pretty obvious to us. If, if we're, we've reached an age where there's, there's more behind us than there is ahead of us. You know? We know that. We, we've spent enough of our past life indulging ourselves. And we know the days are short. I mean, if we're just going to talk in this lifetime, then my days are shorter because of my age. I don't have as much time left here just to get to the average age of a man as I did in the past. And so now I need to, as the Bible tells us, redeem the times for the days are evil. I need to get after it. I need to get after God. I need to not be so much time on, you know, whatever. I mean, if you break down the average day, I think we talked about this when we went through Psalm 90 a couple weeks ago. The average person, when you break down their day and how much time they spend on things, they have about four hours a day to live. That's it. When you take into account sleeping, working, eating, social media, which is probably, for some of us, might cut it in half. You might only have two hours a day to live might see that four hours of that's your lifetime. That's right there. That you just live for four hours on your phone and your computer. But when they broke it all down, four hours a day is all we have to live. Because all this other stuff is so much more important. And if we only have four hours a day to live, then how many years do we really have to live? And even if we're not going to cut out anything else, if four hours a day, that's all you have to live. That's interact with kids and wife and, and whatever else. If that's all you have in those four hours a day, that you're going to break off and, and exemplify Jesus in and read your Bible and pray and, and then walk whatever's left of those four hours as an example of Jesus Christ. How many more years do you really have serving the Lord? Not very many. Not very many. And listen, even if you can cut out some of the other things, you get up earlier, an hour earlier in the morning, or uh, you know, you go to bed an hour later at night, or you spend less time eating, or you spend less time in the bathroom, or whatever you're doing, and you try to chisel out some more time. Say you could get that up to eight hours. If you could really double your living time in a day, and you had eight hours a day to live, to pray and read your Bible and interact with your family and, and your friends. Still, how many more day, how many more years have you actually accumulated to live for Jesus? It's not many. It's not many. Now add to that. Let's take it. Uh, that's just 
a lifetime, a man's lifetime, about 75 years. Now, let's take somebody who really knows the scripture, and if they believe like I do that the days are very short, that really Jesus could come at any time, that his return is imminent. Somebody who can take you into the scriptures and into the prophecies and the end times prophecies and explain to you and reason to you why we believe it's so close. Now how much time do you have? How much more do you have? How much more earnestly should we be sharing the gospel with people? How much more earnestly should we be setting an example, teaching our children and our grandchildren? How much more focused should that little bit of time every day be for Jesus? And that's what Peter's trying to talk about here. You've ceased from sin, you're getting into that. You're, you understand that time is short. And so you live. In verse 3 says, for we have spent it, we've spent enough time in our lifetime, in our past lifetime. And that's not, you know, see the Bible teaches re, or reincarnation. No, it's not a past life. It is your past years. The years you've already lived. You can't get those back. You, so it's time maybe to grow up and realize, I, I did enough for me back there. I don't need to do that anymore. I need to be focused on Jesus. I need to be focused on that. Everything needs to be ministry opportunity. Look for it all the time. But then he describes what we did. Walking, uh, uh, doing the, the will of the Gentiles. And that's just a way of saying the lost. This is when we lock, walked in lewdness. And lewdness is shameful behavior. Absolutely shameful behavior. Things that would have been unacceptable. I'm not even going back to my grandma, grandpa's time. Unacceptable 10 years ago. Are fully embraced now. And, and, and who are you to even say we shouldn't act it out in public? Shameful behavior. Right? In lust. And that's multiple lust. That's not a lust. That's multiple things. So you just, oh, I gotta have this. Chasing that. Everybody's got, people talk about having a bucket list. And, and if I die without completing my bucket list, or at least 75% of it, I'm just not gonna be happy when I die. You're not gonna care when you die. Right? Get over the lust part. Drunkenness, and this is speaking of a habitual drunkenness. This is the alcoholic. This is the one who, and you know, it's, it's, it's a real thing. It's hard. It's hard to break away from that. But you need to. You need to get away from it. Revelries is private or public idolatry with a mob-like behavior. So, not your own little closet where you got a goat head and candles and whatever else in your house and nobody else knows about it. We're not talking about this. We're talking about publicly being idolatrous to the point of, of interacting like a mob. They would spill out of their temples and, and their behaviors would come out with them that were a part of the, of the worship of the false gods. Remember we talked about Timothy. Stopping a, a pagan, or trying to stop a, a pagan uh, mob, kind of like this, a parade with the mob mentality, uh, and trying to sh stop it by, by preaching the gospel, I think it was to Diana, and the mob grabbed him, beat him, drug him through the streets, and then stoned him to death. And if you think it can't happen, you got two murders in Seattle. In one, they don't have any clue of what happened because the mob wouldn't let them in to investigate. 
in our riots, how many people have died? And that's just in the last couple of months. These things are spilling out all over the place. The, the, the idolatry with a mob-like or a frenzied behavior. A frenzied behavior. And I'm telling you, if you've seen any, any even videos of things that, that happened with some of the false teachers in the 60s and 70s, where they would have their little parties and, and what would happen in those rooms with those people is disgusting. But it was out of control, frenzy, screaming, yelling, carrying on, uncontrollable laughter. Sounds like some of the things you see in some of the churches now. That's idolatry. I'm sorry. If it's happening in a church, it's idolatry. And it, it becomes frenzied. They get out of control. They're, they're howling, they're screaming, they're carrying on. And uh, they'll say, oh, casting a demon out over here, casting. They're the ones, that, the guy on the stage is the one that got them worked up to it to begin with. It's easy to do with a group of people. It, it's done all the time. Look at the, the day Jesus was condemned. Just four days before that, the mob was saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Four days later, they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas. You know? It's, it's easy to do. And it says the, the, the Pharisees worked among the crowd, got them worked up. It's, it's really easy to do. The mayor of Minneapolis shows up at some demonstration gets up on the stage and they start hammering him with questions and they asked him are you going to defund the police and he tried to talk around it and they said I asked you a question you need to answer now these are he's a democrat are you going to defund the police and when he said no they booed him and walked him out of the crowd and out away from the demonstration he had a big old walk of shame he had to take and and it works him up I told you about the pastor last week that got run out of out of the little area there in Seattle. All it took was one person to oppose what he did and a mob grew out of it. And I'm telling you now, it's idolatry because it's false gods they're worshiping. It's 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 money, it's sex, it's abortion, it's all of it. All of those things had gods in the Greek time and in Roman time. And even back all the way to, to the establishment of Babylon. They all had that. They all had names for the gods that they, that they performed their services to and their worship to. So now people say, well, they're not really idolatrous. They don't have their temples. They don't have their gods, the names of their gods. Doesn't matter. It's the same behavior. They're worshiping the same false gods. And Paul calls them demons. Those false gods are demons. Anyways. Get off my soapbox, right? So drunkens, revelries, drinking parties. That's speaking of social drinking. Social drinking that leads to excess. Peter says, shouldn't be a part of it. And, you know, you can, you know, I'm not going to tell you, if you, you want to have a, a glass of wine at dinner time, have a glass of wine at dinner time. The Bible doesn't talk about that. But Peter's warning that social drinking will lead to excess. And when 1 in 14 Americans become an alcoholic when they take their first drink, what kind of control is there in that? How easy is it for you to slip from dr social drinking into drunkenness? So we need to, you need to be very careful of that. You need to use your head. You know, don't. Don't go to parties. The nothing. I can look back on parties I went to as a kid, and there would be you know, drugs and alcohol there, and nothing good ever came out of it. Even if you felt good when you left, nothing good ever came out of it because you had to wake up the next day. 
And if you weren't in pain from what you did, your problems were still there that you were trying to get away from. So nothing good comes from the, from the party scene. And abominable idolatries. In regard to these, think they, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They think you're crazy. Why wouldn't you want to do these things? It all feels good. And if you've broken out of that, if you've come out of that, Paul said some of you used to be like this list of people when he gave his list, encouraging us to have grace and to still take the gospel to them, but you don't participate in their life anymore, in their lifestyle. But they think it's strange that you don't act like that anymore, that you're not going to run with them anymore. We're having a party. Yeah, I'm not coming. Why not? Well, you know, this thing happened to me. I got saved. Now I got a Bible study on Friday night. You want to go? Well, I'm going to the party. I just, you know, I just tell you that. Why? Why would you? You gonna go study the Bible instead of coming to the party? Yeah. Our, you know, got anything to do on Saturday night? Eh, no, not really. Have a party. Come to the party. Yeah, no. Why not? Because I know you guys, you're going to have, you know, you're going to be drinking. You're going to be, you know, get a little out of control, get a little wild, have, you know, your good time. Yeah, but you used to do that. You did that with us all the time. No, I'm not doing it anymore. Well, why? There's your question, right? There you're back to give the reason you have for your hope. Man, I, I asked God to forgive me of my sins. I got saved. I got to get ready for church on Sunday morning. Um, you know, I'm going to honor God with my life. What? Are you crazy? They're going to think it's strange that you don't run in that, that flood of dissipation, that consumption, that lifestyle that will consume you. It's consuming them. They think they're consuming the stuff, but that, that style, that thinking, it, it's consuming them. It used to consume you. It was all you could think about, right? Monday through Thursday, and then you start really watching the clock on Friday, because when I get out, man, party time. Man, you party on Friday, you party on, on Saturday, and you recover on Sunday. It's consuming them. And they can talk about how much they can drink or how big of a pile they can snort, but it's consuming them. They're not consuming it. It's wicked and it's evil and it's taking them to hell. It's consuming them. And they're going to speak evil of you when you. So when they go to the party, man, hey man, where's Glenn? Ah, uh, he ain't coming. Why? No, oh, he's some Bible thumper now. He's, you know, Jesus freak. I'm gonna be okay with that. You know? it says they will, they will give an account to him, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So they might speak evil of you. They might even speak evil of you to your face. And you, you, you might be tempted and have to fight off the temptation just to make it stop. Or you stand your ground and you feel bad. But they're going to have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So your stand now is a testimony. Your refusal to go back to the old life now is a testimony. A testimony of the one who is ready to, to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men uh, in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And so, it's kind of a, Peter saying, we know. We know there are those who are dead who will all, they're just going to stay that way. But we preach to them anyways. And we know that there are those who are alive who are going to come to life in Christ 
And they're going to live. And they're going to, they're going to have true life within them. And we, so we've preached to the lost because we know that some will come. But we also know that some are going to reject. And it says that they might be judged according to, the, to men in the flesh. So they're going to be judged. They got to be careful. Verse six is, is everybody like stays away from verse six. Uh, <laughs> for this reason, let me read the whole thing. For this reason was pre, or the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to, to God in the spirit. Okay, let me make sure I get this right because. And I think I was heading down the wrong road. Not that the principle is not biblical, but it's not for this. And I hate that when people take a verse and they preach a, a biblical principle that's not there. That is. All right, so for this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. All right, so the non-believers, that they might be judged according uh, to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So he's just summing up that whole thing. Uh, what he's been talking about. When you were dead, you had the gospel presented to you. Right. <laughs> I really want to make sure I get this right. Uh, we preached it to those who were dead. Right? That they might be judged according to uh, men in the flesh. So people are going to judge you once you accept Jesus as your Savior. But, in spite of their judgment... You live according to God in the Spirit. So trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to maintain you. Listen, if it comes down to it's just you and God, your entire friends and family circle goes away, you still have the greatest ever with you. Almighty God is with you. And He'll build that back up for you in another way. Right? But when you were dead, man... You, you heard the gospel. That's what changed your life. Men might judge you for embracing that. But you still have life in you to be able to live according to the Spirit. I think I got it right that time. Clear as mud, right? I hate to end with that. <laughs> Peter's going to complain a little bit in Second Peter about Paul's writings being hard to understand. Being at the level of scripture, but hard to understand. And Peter throws this in here and then points the finger at Paul. <laughs> he, gets a, he gets a little wordy himself sometimes. But that's the fisherman who used to just open his mouth and say everything or anything. And now, now he's deep, deep thinker. 35 years after that, he's a deep thinker. So there's hope for us. 35 years from now, you'll be able to say, man, that guy who tried to explain that on Sunday morning was just not all there. But now I understand it. <laughs> so, anyways, it doesn't change the theme of anything we've talked about today. God expects us, wants us, calls us to a different life than we used to live. A different life than those around us live. Full of love and grace and mercy. All of which we'll get to hopefully next week. But called to that. You are called. And we're called, again, as we'll see next week, to be stretched. This walking with the Lord is not easy. But it's full of strength and power because the same spirit that raised Christ from the, from the dead dwells in you, dwells in me. Never will he ever leave us or forsake us. And even when the pastor screws some things up, you can still understand it. That's the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words. And Lord, for the challenges. Lord, you have not held back anything in the, in the uh, sense of a challenge for those who follow you. You have challenged us to leave the old life behind. You have challenged us to look forward and to run full strength with your love and grace and mercy in our heart, being an example of you to everyone around us, to bring glory and honor to you and not to ourselves. You've challenged us to be different. You've promised the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
to help us be different. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts every day. And make yourself known to us from the very moment we wake up. And fill us with your spirit. Enable us to do the things that you've called us to do. And I ask for that, but I also know that you will. Because your word has said that you will. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for making yourself known to us. And we pray that we would uh, be able to be the light. And that you speaking through us and living through us would bring so many more into the kingdom before the end. In Jesus' name, amen.